This is TREP Wire Week in Review for week ending November 6th. I'm Martha Kocher with TREP, a data modeling and analytics firm for the CMBS commercial real estate and CLO markets. I'm with Manus Clancy, Senior Managing Director and Joe McBride, Head of Siri Finance. This week, the election results are, of course, what many of us are still watching. And with Biden in the lead, it's going to come down to the four key battleground states in their final counts with very thin margins. Key ballot measures in California were defeated, one for rent control and another for an adjustment of property tax rates. But in Maine, voters said yes to rent control. The Fed today kept rates unchanged and expressed renewed concern over rising COVID cases, and Wall Street had its biggest rally since April. Manus, what's behind the rally? Well, that's a great question. I, I wish I knew. I have to call myself incredibly perplexed um, by the rally, to be honest, you know, uh, to orient everybody, we are recording this on Thursday afternoon, two days after Election Day. And what we've seen this week uh, is an 8.9% rally in the NASDAQ, of which 6.6% came over the last two days. So the Wednesday and Thursday after Election Day. And I understand there may be some relief um, from the election being over. Maybe there's some certainty that comes with the campaign being finished. And I kind of get that big exhale that, that comes with it. Uh, but there isn't a great deal of certainty yet uh, that's still kind of um, playing out. And when I look for what might be the drivers of this rally, uh, I'm left scratching my head. And, and let me take another step back for just a moment. You know, we are CRE guys, we're not political guys. Um, so when we're talking about CRE, we're on pretty firm footing. When we start talking about uh, inside the beltway, it becomes more of a amusing than anything else. Not amusing, but a... Not amusing at all, but amusing. It's amusing. <laughs> um, but, you know, here are, my, here are my musings. You know, on the stimulus side, perhaps people are thinking that maybe a stimulus package will be done uh, as a result of the election, but it never seemed to be President Trump that was standing in the way of a big number. It seemed like he was willing to go big on a, on a stimulus package, and it was more the, the Senate that was the impediment. And now we know that the Senate, uh, the Senate appears to be staying red. So I'm not sure how that makes the argument that we're going to see some kind of big stimulus package in the near term. Um, you know, the, the betting odds right now are, are showing, you know, Biden maybe eight to one, nine to one, likely to win. Uh, or one to nine, I guess. He, he's the heavy favorite, I should say. Trump is, Trump is nine to one. Um, so, you know, in the, you know, post-election day uh, or 2021, we now have a victor, if you will, that is heavily in favor, at least in um, the campaign run-up in, in terms of more lockdowns, right? Which would seem to be another drag on the economy. And then you have the regulatory side, which is a, a big, big unknown. And, and this is not a pejorative statement in any way, but um, if, if a Biden cabinet were to have um, Elizabeth Warren as the head of treasury, you know, it's inevitable that you'd have a heavier hand, right? Um, President Trump was able to remove some of the um, stress testing limits, raise them for banks, uh, loosen some regulatory requirements kind of across the entire economy. And if you have a uh, executive branch that is more heavy handed, and again, that's not a pejorative term, it's hard to see how that's bullish for the economy. Yet all three major indices now are very close to their all time highs. So uh, count me among the confused. <laughs> As per usual, here's the deal. The, the way I see it on election night, Tuesday night at, you know, nine or 10 o'clock, whenever it was, when Trump was actually uh, favored heavily in the betting markets because the early returns were coming in and they were looking good for him. The few, the S and P 500 futures were up astronomically, right? So when the market thought that Trump was going to win, the futures were way up. Right. And then in the morning we woke up and said, Whoa, I don't, that it doesn't seem like that's going to happen. Uh, the stock market went up even still. So I think that, you know, to me, none of nothing really matters. I think that there's the stock market was looking for 
or waiting for a reason to move, right? And the election day being over and past was a reason. And you got to think that there's a ton of money that was slowly drained out of uh, 401ks and, you know, brokerage accounts and everything else across the economy. People saying, you know, I'm not really sure how this is going to go. Maybe I'll take, you know, five or 10% out of my account and put it in cash. I think that once there was any level of certainty, especially that it's not a blue wave, like whether you're left or right, Republican or Democrat, like any sort of certainty is good for the market. And I think that it seems like we're pretty sure that it's going to be a split, you know, Congress uh, with Biden at, at the helm. So that to me seems like one of the least, you know, volatile outcomes in terms of, you know, new regulations and new laws and everything and new policies, right? Because I think the Senate's going to hold back any sort of, you know, uh, really accelerated changes anyway. Yeah, I mean, I could see that. What you said just made a lot of sense, right? That there's, it's a huge part relief and perhaps the market was pricing in a blue wave where they thought um, the recent uh, tax reductions would be rolled back very quickly and the regulatory state would be even more um, unlimited, if you will. So, so that makes a lot of sense. Um, I still look at the economic data um, coming in uh, this week, which was kind of a, a parenthetical to everything else that was going on. And, and there's still an awful lot of um, brown shoots, if you will, or troublesome shoots, whatever the opposite of a green shoot is. You know, we saw a very weak uh, ADP jobs number uh, this week. Um, initial jobless claims came in pretty much where they were expected to at about 750,000, but that's still naggingly high. And don't forget, we have a wave of pollsters hitting the unemployment line uh, over the next six weeks. <laughs> mm, they, should, they might need to stay there. Nate Silver's looking for a job. <laughs> well, you know what? The, the um, silver lining is they're also looking for poll watchers now that uh, there's five or six states being contested <laughs> that they can all roll from uh, one polling job to another. Maybe they can go be contact tracers. You know, <laughs> where are you today? Are you, feel, are you feeling any symptoms? No? Yes? Okay. So, Joe, we saw a number of decisions on commercial real estate measures in a couple of states, and we've talked about them before, but I did want to talk about them briefly because now we've got some decisions. Yeah, so uh, we talked about Prop 15 in California with Lonnie uh, a few weeks ago, and that was the just, I don't know the ex all of the details, but the general gist was that commercial properties would be assessed at fair value, um, whereas residential properties would stay on the old system, which is they don't get assessed until there is a transaction. So that was actually shot down pretty, in a pretty close call, I would say. I think it was 51.7% voting no. Uh, so a really kind of tight uh, dispersion there, which I found interesting because on the other proposition, which was Prop 21, which was a essentially like a government rent control um, proposition where the government could mandate uh, how much you could rent certain units for when they go vacant, you know, uh, in I think it was buildings over 15 years old or something like that. And that was struck down handily. That was almost 60% of the vote was for no. So it's kind of to me, it's a little interesting. I would think if you voted no on one, you'd vote no on the other. Um, but maybe the, just that Prop 15 was probably not fully understood by a lot of people. Um, but 21, rent control, everyone kind of generally understands that message. But I think in a, in a state where there's a lot of uh, people fleeing due to super high taxes and uh, a lot of other issues uh, to more business-friendly states, I think this was a, probably a net positive for California, um, because uh, it, especially in the real estate Twitter world of California real estate investors, they were all very much against these both of these propositions. And you know, now I think you're you could have if they voted yes, you would have had a lot more obstacles and impediments to investment and to building new new units and things like that. So I'm, 
you know, I'm glad for them, I guess. I don't want to be too political, but being a real estate guy, I'm glad for them. <laughs> Looking at the delinquency report that we released in its final form this Monday, did we have any new takeaways from that, Manus? Well, the headline was that the delinquency rate fell fairly substantially, more than 60 basis points. And that continues a trend that started in July, where we've seen the rate now retreat about uh, 200 basis points. That is the good news. Um, big chunks of that came from uh, retail and hotel, which both saw several points worth of improvement. Uh, that's the glass half full story. Uh, the glass half empty story is a lot of these uh, cures, if you will, or reversion from delinquent to current are a function of forbearances. So it's a little bit of a, a false positive, so to speak, that this number is being uh, suppressed a little bit because of the relief being granted. Uh, we've talked in the past about what happens when relief ends and, and where do we go from there? So there's two anecdotes we could talk about from data that came in during the month of October. The first one is the Godfrey Hotel, which is a full service hotel that was built in 2014 in Chicago. It backs a $45 million loan that was securitized in 2017. Um, performance was terrific in 2019, 95% occupancy, uh, 1.76 X debt service coverage ratio, uh, H1 2020 debt service coverage ratio flipped to negative and occupancy dropped 30 points to 65%, uh, percent, you know, an extraordinary fall off. This loan was 60 days delinquent in July. Uh, a forbearance was granted. The loan went back to current in August that forbearance expired and then back in October this is now 60 days delinquent again so that's example number one of what we think could accelerate in November we're looking for this very closely and next week we get a a pretty big wave of remittance data coming through and we should get a sense of um, how much of this is taking place the other one uh, this was a story that was written up I believe in the real deal as well a uh, $105 million loan uh, at 597 Fifth Avenue, which is near Rock Center. Uh, the property was built in 1913, uh, and it was one, one time the home of Shrivener's Books, back when bookstores were really uh, popular. Later, it was a Sephora and then a Lululemon. Wow, um, what, a, what a great microcosm of like the evolution of our economy. Yes. Right. It went from hardcover books to make up to yoga pants. Wow. <laughs> really? Yeah, it's they, a timeline. They're, they're probably looking for the next one uh, right now. Maybe it's a Peloton <laughs> store. Um, the loan was uh, current for a while, but special servicer notes point out that the relief has ended. And as of October, uh, the loan is 60 days delinquent again. There is some MES debt on the property and the loan itself is part of CMBX 8. So not indicative of a trend by any means, but just some anecdotes of properties that struggled, got some relief, became current in the process, relief ends, and now are back on uh, the concern list. It's just, for me, it seems like it's a matter of if they could just make it another three months, like maybe I'm being optimistic here, but if you could just hold out another three months or so, but then again, you know, even if we get a vaccine in three months, it's going to take a year before people are truly comfortable, probably, and before, you know, leisure, like lodging, occupancy, and things like that return to a sense, some sense of normalcy. The whole holding out for three more months reminds me, this is really taking us far afield, was, you know, 50 years ago, there was an alternative basketball league the aba yep. and probably over its history it probably had 20 teams it had teams in pittsburgh and uh denver and dallas and miami and so forth long before there were nba teams the florida floridians and the pittsburgh pipers and it was always uh living on fumes you know their teams <laughs> would go bankrupt and they'd get 2,000 people a night had some great talent too 
Moses Dr. Malone, J. Dr. J, Artis Gilmore, Jackie Moon. <laughs> the uh, and, and towards the end, almost every team was bankrupt. There were seven left, and then one fell. I think it was the Virginia Squires that fell, and, and then another fell. Four would ultimately get absorbed. Uh, the Indiana Pacers, the Nets, I think the Spurs and the Denver Nuggets, if I'm not mistaken, were the four. And But the fifth team that didn't make it was the Kentucky Colonels. And if I have it correct, they agreed to be bought out. They didn't want to be bought out, but they did. And their buyout was for, in perpetuity, one-seventh of all future uh, television revenue from either the all four teams that left or maybe just the Pacers. But it turned out to be something that they threw in as we'll never make any money with television to <laughs> now that perpetuity is worth billions. It's like the Bobby Bonilla deal. Spirits of St. Louis. There you go. Moses Malone, Fly Williams. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think who else. There's a great book about this uh, that's worth reading, Loose Balls. But um, yeah, so I don't, I don't think it's the same thing's going to happen with Lululemon if they hold on for another three months or you know, it's all going to be okay. But uh, just the whole holding on thing took me on that really wild diversion. We just need, we just need special servicers that, and bondholders and everybody else, all the people in the virtuous or, or vicious circle that we talk about, you know, if they, if they can do 90 more days, we might, we might get through this, you know, but I don't know. I might be way too optimistic in that. We'll see. I think it's a slogan, 90 more days. 90 more days. We had a number of Q3 earnings reports this week, and they were from CRE firms and REITs that we wanted to call some attention to. The big one for me in terms of just interest was Avalon Bay. Avalon Bay is a high-end apartment provider. Um, they really kind of span the gamut geographically and also you know, kind of market-wise. They do have both urban exposure as well as suburban exposure, really kind of high end, um, nice looking, at least the ones that I know in our area, pricey properties. And they really made it a point to uh, differentiate the performance they were seeing in their suburban portfolio from what they were seeing in their metropolitan markets. You know, they kind of singled out um, metropolitan New York, New Jersey and Northern California as areas that had uh, effective rent declines, pricing pressure, um, lease terminations and declines in occupancy. So um, for those looking at the tea leaves uh, in the multifamily space for what represents a soft spot versus what represents a strength, um, that's not a bad place to start your day. It really does give you a sense of what a well-diversified REIT is seeing across multiple markets. And it's really not that different than what we've heard from Lonnie and what we've talked about here, that in the major 24 hour cities where housing is expensive and the need to be in the office is light. And in addition, in some cases, COVID exposure has been high. That's where you'd expect to see kind of the, some of the softness. And in other areas where COVID has been less impactful and where people work and live in near proximity, but not in white collar jobs, that should hold up better. Um, and, and this kind of seems to underscore, you know, that instinct that we've had. I listened to uh, a bunch of the mortgage REITs uh, earnings as well. Those are the guys that uh, lend mostly on, you know, first lien and some mes transitional type properties, the Blackstones and the KKRs and the the uh, Annalise and so on. And uh, they were fairly, uh, I wouldn't say upbeat, but they were definitely confident. I think they spent, the, there was definitely a theme across all of them that they spent the last two quarters shoring up their capital and, you know, refinancing bank warehouse lines and uh, uh, getting rid of any sort of um, margin callable securities or, or getting rid of a lot of them. And uh, I think the only concern, at least, you know, from my, that I can kind of glean out of it, and it, it may be what they're not saying, which is volume, just origination, right? So you spent two or three quarters in cleanup, asset management, you know, 
uh, forbearance or modification mode. And now it's time to, you know, you got a billion dollars of dry powder on the side. Now it's time to put it to work. And there may not necessarily be that many um, deals that fall into your parameters from the past. Now, maybe some of these guys pivot and start, you know, expanding kind of into the riskier space, or maybe they start providing some note on note stuff or whatever it may be. I'm not sure, but I would say that their, you know, their reserves mostly were flat to slightly lower than last quarter um, due to the improvement in the economy and the improvement in economic prospects. Uh, but still, you know, pretty high level of, of loan loss reserves there. I also, uh, you know, moving away from earnings reports, there were a few uh, just quarterly kind of data dumps from CBRE and Newmark. I mean, uh, Doug Larson from Newmark, I'm on his distribution list somehow, and he sends out some really good stuff. So give him a shout out if he's a listener. Um, he put out a bunch of data, uh, which I'll just go through a couple of the highlights. Um, the uh, mobility from pre-pandemic levels, I like this. Uh, and I think this is in the New York City area. Walking down 28%, buses down 47%, Metro North down 54%, LIRR down 62%, and subways down 65 This is as of September. Um, now, it kind of surprised me, the Metro North number, that 44% of people are still getting on that train uh, in the morning. I guess I'm, a, I'm in my bubble here working from home. Uh, there was another uh, interesting chart out of uh, the Newmark deck, which was talking about uh, basically lease rates, um, free rent, you know, net effect of rents, things like that. And they, the gist was that, you know, the difference between the, what they call the base taking rent or the, you know, the quoted rent and the effective rent is actually down about 11%. So basically, if you say, you know, we're going to charge you uh, 15 bucks a foot, uh, it actually turns out to be 11% less or so on average after you get free rent and other sort of, uh, you know, tenant improvements and things built into that, that rent. So uh, it's one of the uh, big drops that we've seen. So maybe asking rents are not necessarily down that much, but the effective rent that the, these landlords are actually getting is, is down pretty good. Um, and then rent collection by property type. I like this. This was from Nacrief uh, and Newmark putting it together. And multifamily was about 93.7% uh, in September, up from you know maybe one or two percentage points lower in the prior months. Uh, retail, this was interesting. In April, the number was 36% um, rent collections, but that's back up to around 71% in September. So there is improvement there. Now, lodging is not here because there's no kind of like, you know, there's no tenants paying leases, right? It's just uh, overnights. But um, I would assume that that, not, that has slightly improved, but not as much as retail. So anyway, that's your data dump. Uh, of the week there. Manus, what are we working on for Tripwire stories in the coming days? Hmm. Let me take a look. This is the SUP with Tripwire segment. Uh, two things that are interesting that uh, I'll, I'll point to. One, which I don't think we've, point, we've spoken about before, but we do put out monthly, is our payoff report which talks about loans that reach their maturity date and what happens to them. So um, in a pool of CMBS, and, and this um, statistic was recommended to us by a longtime client more than a decade ago. So we've been following it since the great financial crisis. And the thesis was, or the, or the data point that this investor wanted to know is what percentage of loans that reach, the, reach their maturity date actually pay off um, as a way of understanding should the client go long uh, interest only bonds that may extend and you get extra free cash flow more than you are expecting. So we've been running this for a long time. Uh, as most people know, um, many loans don't get to the maturity date. They, they prepay early with yield maintenance or a, a fixed penalty or they defease or they 
prepay, you know, right at the open period. So we're just tracking things that really make it to their maturity date and, and what happens to them. And the interesting thing we've seen is a real collapse in the percentage of loans that actually get paid off at their maturity date. And it kind of makes sense, you know, that in this type of environment, um, you would see a, a really meaningful drop off, uh, especially since hotels and retail properties will struggle to refinance. The number we'll put out tomorrow morning shows that of the uh, 550 some odd million in loans that matured this month, only 17% of them by balance paid off. So 83, 84% um, did not mature with the borrowers looking for either monthly, you know, month over month roll of the maturity date or some kind of meaningful uh, modification that extends so it. The, uh, and the denominator there, I think you, you said it already, but just to clarify, the denominator is all loans that are going into their maturing month without any issues, right? right. They're not paid off already. They're, and they're not delinquent, right? Or do we right. include- I, I take out delinquent loans. If something is yeah. already 90 days delinquent going into the month, right? Um, that's, that's a problem. That's a, that's a term default. We already default. know that's a problem, right? That's a term default. It's not a maturity default. Right. So to give a, a kind of perspective, a year ago, um, the rolling 12-month average of loans that were paying off when they reached their balloon date was about 70%, and that's by balance. So seven in $10 worth of maturing loans were um, paying off uh, on the balloon date. This month, the 12-month rolling average is 36%. So the number has been kind of cut in half. This month, as we said, 17.6% in October. We've seen over the last six months totals of 12.5%, 9.3%, 5.3%. Every now and then it gets into the 50s, um, you know, if, if one big loan pays off. But it just goes to show that um, what everybody knows already, credit is tight right now and um, doubly so for hotel and retail properties. Do you have so the three month number there? What percentage pays off in three months after yeah. that? I do have it, but not in front of me. So okay. we could talk about that next week. Okay. Um, it doesn't grow much actually that yeah. if you don't pay off, it, it used to, it used to be the kind of thing that- um, They just needed another month to finish the refinance, right? Right. And now we're just seeing if you're, if you miss your balloon date now, you're likely to miss it for several months, right? That, that, that they hang out there much more than, than they did a year ago. Um, as we, you know, I said before a year ago, that 12 month average was 70%. I would guess that after three months, that 12 month average a year ago was like 90%. Right. That nine out of $10 were repaid within three months. So definitely not the case here. The other story we're working on, which we'll probably talk about um, on Monday is the Walden Galleria. It's a property in Cheek, Tawaga. I doubt I pronounced that properly. New York, upstate New York. Um, it backs a single asset CMBS deal. The mall, which backs, as I said, a single asset deal was valued. The collateral was valued at 600 million at securitization. Um, this month it was lowered to, if I can read my notes correctly, 216 million, which is slightly below the loan balance. Uh, so that's kind of the, the bad news. Hopefully it's 216 and not 260, but either way, it's around the, the loan balance. Um, the positive news is that a forbearance was granted um, that carries the borrowers through the beginning of next year uh, and gives them some relief. So it seems to be a situation where the borrower is fighting for the property and good for them for that. Um, but the value, as you can see, cut by more than half. Manus, at the top of our podcast, we talked about the new presidential agenda and there's a possibility that we'll see some renewed emphasis on surveillance and risk management, which of course we saw after the great financial crisis. So let's talk a little bit about risk retention, which is an area that we've covered substantially in, uh, in some cases. So Joe or Manis? Take it away. Take this it away. is the education segment brought to you by Lonnie Hendry. Um, yeah, risk retention, uh, I was uh, intimately familiar with, uh, because we were building a product or two around it back in, uh, 2016. 
This was late. I think it was December 24th, 2016, when this went into effect. I might be wrong on that, but it was either like Christmas Eve or New Year's Eve or something like that back in 2016. And the whole concept is, uh, to keep it simple, the concept is that uh, the regulators wanted the originators slash the issuers of securitized products to have some skin in the game. So the whole point of securitization is that I can originate a loan and then sell it off and be done, right? And I can sell, uh, I can originate a hundred dollar loan and sell it for hundred dollars and fifty cents or a hundred and one bucks and move on and then keep originating and I make money through that churn. And some of the uh, criticism of the structure after the great financial crisis was that this misaligns interests, right? So the ultimate owner of the loan of the asset, or you know, it is an asset to the to the bondholders, the bondholders have one incentive, which is to, you know, buy proper risk adjusted bonds based on their uh, profile. Whereas the originators had a different incentive, which was to just originate as many dang loans as you possibly could. Right. And that was the, the gist of that was that the originator didn't have any skin in the game after they originated the loan. Now, how much of that is true versus not true. And you know what the, attribution of that is to any sort of financial crisis stuff. I don't know. I don't think anyone will ever be able to tell you. Um, But risk retention came about to try and fix that. And it's essentially a rule where if you are an issuer of CMBS or uh, other structured products, you have to uh, retain a certain portion of the uh, bonds that you sell uh, for a certain number of years. So In CMBS, I don't know all the nuances in the other asset classes, so I don't want to talk about that. But in CMBS, there's basically two options. The CMBS issuer can uh, hold on to 5% of the deal. And I guess it's three options. They call it a vertical, a horizontal, and an L shape, right? So let's take the horizontal. That's an easier one to think about. The horizontal risk retention means that the bottom 5% right? So you've got tranches A, B, C, D, E, all the way down. The bottom tranches are the riskiest ones. They take the first losses. The bottom 5% of the waterfall has to be held by the issuer, or in most cases, when it's horizontal, it has to be sold to a qualified B piece investor who then has to hold that for five years. So the other version is vertical where the issuer actually holds on to a 5% slice of every single tranche from the top to the bottom of the waterfall. Now, there's some nuances in here about how the 5% is calculated. If it's horizontal, it has to be 5% of the proceeds of the deal. Now, I'm, I'm already seeing Martha and Keegan fall asleep, but stick with us, all right? The proceeds of the deal makes it more complicated because you you're selling let's say a hundred dollar bond at the bottom of the structure but you're not selling it for a hundred bucks you're selling it for 75 bucks or 70 bucks or whatever it may be you're selling it for a discount so what ends up happening is you actually have to hold on to more of the the bottom part of the structure than if you were doing it based on face value now if you do the vertical piece you actually just do it based on face value So there's all sorts of math and the issuers do all sorts of math on every single deal to figure out which way is more economical for them. I'd say there's, there's, you know, probably a decent, relatively um, average split between vertical versus horizontal deals. Um, There were some uh, L-shaped deals that came out, but that there's been a lot less of that. It's very confusing where you hold two and a half percent of the face value vertically and two and a half percent of the proceeds horizontally and blah, blah, blah. But, uh, that's the, that's the general gist of it. And we're four plus years into it. And, um, there was worries that this was going to hurt the capital availability in the market and liquidity in the market and things like that. And so far those worries seem to be unfounded. Yeah. There's a couple of, uh, couple of takeaways from that. You know, number one is this risk retention was baked in quite a long time ago, long before it became operative, you know, it was baked. So people had been anticipating it for a long time. Once it did come in, the structure was 
um, very well received. And in fact, uh, deals that have the risk retention structure tend to trade much tighter than the ones without it. So in, investors liked it. Um, a quick detour for a shameless plug. We actually do a lot of analysis on risk retention bonds um, for some of our big dealer clients, which helps them uh, manage this risk and understand this risk. Um, so that gives us kind of a bird's eye view into uh, how they, they look at this. But my last point on the matter is that, um, you know, this took an act of Congress, uh, the Dodd-Frank uh, mandates to, to put in a lot of these um, items that led to more um, regulation. And while there's some things that a, a Biden administration could do, like put a, a heavier hand on lending for banks or stress testing, uh, higher frequency of stress testing, things like that, more meaningful changes, you know, would probably have to come through some kind of act of, of Congress. And with a split Congress, if things stay as they appear, um, that may be a, a heavier thing to change. Yeah, the other shameless plug we need to throw in here is we actually had uh, a UNC professor, Dr. Andrea Ghent, um, and a Penn State professor, Dr. Brent Ambrose. It was several months ago. Actually, I think it was pre-pandemic. We had a webinar uh, where they had done a, an academic study of risk retention, pricing, and performance uh, versus pre-risk retention. Uh, and that was, uh, so take a look at that. I think, you know, info.trep.com or email us podcast at trep.com. And we can share that with you. It's pretty interesting. I think like 30 minute video, 40 minute video, something like that. If you haven't listened to our, uh, interview with, uh, Dr. David Hartzell from, he's the director of the uh, real estate school at UNC and Caroline O'Neill, who's one of his MBA students who actually runs a student led real estate investment fund. That was one of my favorite interviews so far. No offense to everybody else. Uh, Ouch. Maybe it's because I, I, I was a little bit jealous of, of Caroline being able to be this kind of, you know, young student at an MBA program, actually managing asset managing, you know, millions of dollars in commercial real estate investments. So definitely take, uh, give that one a listen. We released it on Tuesday, which was, you know, Maybe uh, it's like, like when the it's years like when, ago, right? Well, nobody was listening to any commercial real estate podcast on Tuesday. Let's yeah. just put it that way. Years ago, so it is worth a listen. And one of the things that Dr. Hartzell did on that podcast was compare the Great Financial Crisis with the current crisis, which he did, uh, I think, to some degree. And of course, we published a piece this week that our own Catherine Liu, an analyst that we have here did a nice deep dive into the comparison between the two. So that also is worth a look. And as always, we've got a number of good shout outs. The first is probably one of my favorites. The first is uh, Danielle D uh, out in, Bro well, not really Brooklyn, but we'll no. say Brooklyn. Uh, the Yankee Clipper, um, yeah, the Yankee Clipper's daughter, who is a, uh, very loyal listener of the podcast. Thank you for uh, giving us a shout out there. And Stevens Financial Services Firm headquartered in Little Rock gave us a very nice shout out on LinkedIn. I know a number of you had done a presentation for their organization and they uh, gave us a plug on LinkedIn, which was nice. And it's Kim great G that we have so many people that are willing to come in and listen. You know, we cut these things and, you know, I'm, I'm a guy that can't listen to my own voice, number one. And number two is, you know. It's hard for me once, too. Once we, once we finish these things, you know, sometimes the subject matter is so dense. I, I, I think it's more like a uh, nonviolent alternative to waterboarding. Right? It's just kind of like a, something that might be popular in Guantanamo Bay. But, but thank you all to you, all, everybody who, who checks in. I think it's, uh, it's wonderful that you enjoy doing this. And we certainly enjoy cutting it for you. Hey, we'll take any listens and downloads that we can, even if it's, you know, you have to put your 10 year old kid in timeout uh, and you, you blast this on the bows in his room. Go. That's, that's all good. We're all, we're all for that. And then uh, I think I had said Kim G who I thought was a good one. She laughed at the reference Joe made last week of the word defenestrate, which of course Joe was talking about removing his shoe and 
by the way, technically it means show, throwing it out the window. I so. was talking about the shoe dropping. Right. Right. The sure. shoe. When is the other shoe going to drop? When is the shoe going to defenestrate itself? Throw out the window. And I think, honestly, Martha, I think it's a it's a slight insult to our listenership to have to, you know, define defenestrate. I think just wanted to give a little color there, <laughs> a little mental picture. And then, of course, Stephen B who uh, wrote to Manus saying that a bunch of his board members for a college real estate, uh, I guess, board, most of them are equity guys, and they had no idea that TREP had more than just CMBS data. So he was quick to let them know that we've got a number of other data sources, including Fannie Freddie, FHA, CRE CLOs, banks, life codes, and corporate CLOs. So thank you for doing that. This is not your father's TREP data. <laughs> Best quote of the day. And of course, we have, as always, a deal of the week or two. Da -da 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 deal of the week. Here we go. The first one, Home Depot taking 120,000 square feet near the 59th Street Bridge in Manhattan, on Manhattan's east side. That bridge was immortalized by the Simon and Garfunkel 59th Street Bridge song. I'm sure if you don't remember the name, you do remember the tune. Um, Have they renamed that bridge yet? It's the Ed Koch, if I'm not That's mistaken. That's what I thought. It's the Koch, yeah. yeah. Uh, the property had been leased to Bed Bath & Beyond. Uh, Home Depot will be closing its store at 731 Lex, which is the home of Bloomberg. Uh, so that store is going away in return for the 59th Street store. Something tells me that Mike Bloomberg is not doing his own home repair, so he's not going to miss that uh, <laughs> that 731 Lexington Avenue Home Depot, I can assure you. Home Depot is said to be paying twice the rent that Bed Bath & Beyond was paying. So, you know, I love these stories, which are about uh, green shoots in New York as a, as a lifelong New Yorker. Um, I do like when people uh, bet on the Big Apple. That's great to see. I I was thinking it was like office space, but you're saying it's retail. Retail. Wow. Yeah, that's right. It's kind of wild to think about a Home Depot in Manhattan, right? Like I think about a Home Depot with a huge giant parking lot and, you know, tons and tons of square footage and hundred feet high ceilings and everything. Like imagine going to Home Depot and then going back to your studio apartment with like 10 two by fours and like I, I, just, I was, I can't I was even picturing imagine. Uh, someone on the subway with a chainsaw. Yeah, right. That's you a little troubling. It might be a little bit light on, you know, wood planers and a little bit heavier on sticky traps. I don't know. You know, it could be <laughs> a, a different <laughs> inventory than right. you might find in uh, White Plains, New York. <laughs> the other deal of the week, this is from commercial property executives. Evelyn Jos Josa uh, reported this one. The Fujitsu campus in Sunnyvale, California was sold for $104 million. It's a 315,000 square foot R&D complex. Lane Partners was the buyer. WJFS was the seller. Uh, it was once a Pfizer um, headquarters, or I should say uh, complex. Will Connors, Daniel Renz, Michael Manas, Bert Lamerson, Kyle Caldwell, and Toss Valentine of JLL rep the seller. And Jordan Angel of JLL helped set up the financing. So Is that your cousin, Michael Manis? No, different spelling. <laughs> so uh, congratulations to them for getting that deal done. You know, that part of the market remains very strong. That uh, industrial slash warehouse slash R&D, uh, especially on the coasts. So no surprise that they were able to get that deal done, but uh, congratulations to all for pulling that off. In October, we saw two banks fail, prompting the question of whether bank failures could be on the rise. Well, they are on the rise because I think last year uh, it was four bank failures. In 2018, it was zero. And we've seen uh, two, two recently to bring the 2020 number up to four. So to give you context, in the bad old days, we were seeing several a month, right, uh, during the great financial crisis. And we were actually, you know, fairly good at predicting them based on our, uh, some of our risk models in the banking space. Uh, but I would 
be surprised to see a huge increase in bank failures, although I'm sure we're going to see more and more of the actual defaults and net charge-offs and reserves starting to flow through the data in the next couple quarters where we hadn't seen them before because there was regulatory relief on, you know, you don't have to consider a COVID-related modification, a, a troubled debt restructuring and all the types of capital treatments that go with that. So anyway, I think that we'll, we'll see definite stress in the banking space, but I don't think we're going to see a ton of new failures. We do come into the into this stretch in a much better place than we were um, 12 years ago. You know, order of magnitude, we saw about 300 banks fail, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, during the great financial crisis. We do have a uh, top-down model that we call our capital adequacy stress test, which runs every bank's balance sheet and income statement through the um, federally mandated scenario. So we don't just do that for the top 50 banks. We do this for every bank in the universe. So we come up with um, what their capital levels and reserve levels and um, you know amount of excess capital they have and so forth for every bank. So in the last financial crisis, I think we predicted something like 295 out of the 300 uh, bank failures. Um, so for anybody who's interested in that, let us know, and we'll be happy to show you our, our forecasts. But looking ahead, we don't make that kind of uh, we don't see that happening again, that kind of number, 300 bank failures, because A, um, banks are in a much better position now in terms of their capital levels than they were going into the last crisis. B, lending uh, was much more disciplined over the last 10 years than it was in the lead up to the great financial crisis. And lastly, while there may be some exceptions, there isn't a huge exposure in our uh, belief to either the shopping mall category or to the hotel category for most banks. There may be um, hints of it in some banks, um, but not a lot. And where you do see retail exposure, a lot of times for these smaller community banks, it tends to be grocery anchored, which is certainly the place to be during the, the current crisis. So fingers crossed that the market remains uh, favorable to banks, both with the administration change, if that's what comes to pass, um, along with the, uh, the current pandemic. Yeah, if we see banks having trouble, it's not going to be from their Siri exposure, uh, most likely. It'll be from their corporates or from their, you know, resi, if there, if there really was a longer term downturn in the economy, which I don't see happening. Um, I would say that there are uh, probably some banks out there who historically have felt very insulated from risk, uh, who may be kind of rethinking that a little bit right now, especially the ones that are have spent a lot of time building up exposure to, you know, uh, primary market, you know, luxury type multifamily, that type of thing, especially with uh, some of the rent control laws that have been passed in New York recently. Uh, as well as obviously what you talked about, Avalon Bay, people moving out of the city, rents going down, you know, valuations as high as they were. Uh, I don't think it's a, a big, big issue, but I'm sure that there are some banks out there who are <laughs> analyzing this very deeply. Well, that's a great point. I, I neglected to say that. I think that if there is a soft spot, it's probably in that high-end uh, luxury um, underdevelopment multifamily stuff that could bite people. Uh, especially in 24-hour cities. It seems like demand has really evaporated there and, and that could become a, a soft spot for banks. And lastly, Inspire Brands, a PE group that controls Arby's and other restaurant chains, maybe some of your favorites, Joe, Sonic, Baskin Robbins, <laughs> Buffalo Wild Wings, has purchased Dunkin' Donuts, which I know is both your favorite and mine. So, you know, it may be that you'll be able to get your roast beef and your favorite coffee and some wings and I don't know what else at the same place. <laughs> and your Pepto-Bismol, hopefully. <laughs> um, yeah, Keegan and I used to, back in the glory days when we, you know, didn't have to work 12 hours a day on Zoom, uh, we would go and take a walk to Dunkin' Donuts, uh, do a little walk around Midtown Manhattan, see the world watch all the buildings get built, you know, see all the same people every day, you know, doing their, their coffee trips. I mean, 
trying That's on one of some those. Lululemon. <laughs> it was like a pretty woman situation. I was trying on my Lululemon for Keegan. Um, but those were, that's like one of Manus's bucket list things. It's like one of my bucket list items now is leaving the office for 15 minutes to go get a cup of coffee with, with another human being. Right. Like I just, it's just, I can't wait for that. But yeah, Dunkin' Donuts is a very, very, has a very, very near and dear place in my heart. I spent junior, senior year of college, my MBA program, and then three summers of studying for the CFA all in a wobbly table at Dunkin' Donuts on Bronx River Road. So if anyone knows the one I'm talking about, you probably saw me there at some point between 2011 and 20, 2014. Give me a shout out. So with that, we'll close. Thanks to our producer and today fact checker, Keegan St. Ange may join us next week as we look at what has happened during the week and how it might be impacting you. If you have a question, a comment, or a picture, send it to us at podcast at trep.com. For more info, visit trep.com and subscribe to the podcast with your favorite provider. Thank you as always for listening and do stay well. All right. <laughs>